actually actually contributed to the increasing amount of data and the computational resources we had. So in this paradigm, competition and the resource, uh, data and competition are the most important. So in this new paradigm, um, there are still many things we don't understand. Uh, for example, uh, we know that the neural network is heavily parameterized, contains millions, uh, billions, or trillions parameters but uh, they somehow do not overfit the data. The, their prediction is still uh, pretty good on the test, test data set. And then um, certainly we cannot count the number of parameters to denote the effective size of parameters, right? So in regression, we have the concept of sparsity, but uh, what's, the, what's the analog in deep learning? It's, we don't know. And uh, so last, uh, people often use back propagation to optimize, to optimize their uh, deep, learning, uh, deep learning loss function. In principle, the loss function has, um, can, can contain millions local minimum. And uh, by somehow using simple methods like SGD or ADAM, we can avoid such a lo bad local minimum. The local minimum we get, uh, we arrive usually are pretty good it, as a manifest manifested by its a good test performance. So th these real questions uh, were not addressed, asked by me, they it, it were raised by Leo Bremer. So Leo, Bremer, Leo was one of the most uh, uh, influential researchers in uh, statistical machine learning. And uh, so just to show you that uh, there are three questions. However, these three questions will, will not be uh, addressed in this talk, so because this is far beyond our uh, reach at this moment. But the, the point I, I raised these two questions to show you that actually um, we are still, there are many things should be done to understand deep learning. So deep learning is the elephant in the room. Uh, it's so big, everybody notices it, but somehow we, have, we do not have a consensus about what's the right way to understand deep learning at, at this moment. Yeah, people will say, oh, yeah, it's a war, or it's a snake, or it's a rope, but nobody say that it's an elephant actually. So there are many issues with the current pro, uh, current research in deep learning theory. For example, people often assume that the, the width is extremely large. So there are many more neurons. There are infinite many neurons in one layer, but which is not the case, right? So and also people often assume like two layer neural, neural network um, in, in, as a, in the assumption, but in, in reality, the number of layers is huge. Yeah, so a, a lesson we have learned in this so many activities is that uh, deep learning is, uh, is uh, very difficult to understand. And at this moment, uh, it's perhaps um, not practical to expect to understand deep learning in a comprehensive way. So instead, uh, in this talk, we propose to do something pragmatic, uh, try to get some surrogate models to understand deep, deep learning. So this is story. Everybody knew, knows about uh, how Newton discovered uh, the law of gravitation. So Newton once was trying to understand how the moon uh, orbits the, uh, our Earth, but uh, the moon is too uh, far, far away, so far beyond the reach of Newton. And uh, but New what Newton have is an apple. So he has so many apples. Yeah, apples are everywhere, and uh, it's it's uh, very close to our daily life. And, uh, but the good thing that the apple, an apple also follows the same law of gravitation just as a moon. So, and uh, so here we want to propose an apple for our deep learning theory in this case. So first of all, uh, so we call such a, a surrogate model. So what is a surrogate model? A surrogate model should be mathematically tractable so we can analyze it using our some, uh, some, some uh, tools, techniques. And the third, second, they should still maintain some important, important characteristics of deep learning. And, um, and third, and uh, by analyzing this surrogate model, we can get some useful insights for, for, uh, to guide the practice of deep learning. So in this talk, we will introduce a surrogate model and uh, we will, how can we develop such a model? Uh, we, we will take a top-down viewpoint and the top, this top-down approach will, let, will lead us to uh, a, the model we want to have for a surrogate model. So this is joint work with uh, uh, two wonderful students, uh, and Tong Fang uh, 
uh, is a former postdoc at, in my department uh, at the Penn State, and now recently he joined uh, the CS department of, uh, of uh, Peking University in China. And Han Fuhe is a final PhD student uh, in the CS department at Penn, and Qi Rong is a, is a colleague at Penn Biostatistics. So the model we will propose in, in this talk is the, just illustrate here. Uh, let's first focus on the left part. So in total, there are uh, L layers. So this is a, a neural network. This is the first layer. So this is the first step where we feed the data into the neural network. And this is second layer up to the last layer. So in this top-down approach, we uh, look from the top to the bottom. We isolate the topmost layers. By isolating, I mean that we keep all the information as it is in for the last layer. And then for the remaining L minus one layers, we just compress it into a single black box. So we, in this uh, compressing, we do not care about the interaction between uh, any layers with, between them. We just treat them as a single unit. And uh, so, this is our primary focus. And uh, actually, we can also consider this slightly extension. We can consider two layer PLD model. By two, I mean that we isolate the top two most layers and the treating the remaining as a single black box. And now let's try to uh, formalize this uh, layer PLD model. And uh, so this is set up for deep learning. And uh, so X is our yeah, input. For example, it's the pixels of an image. And the W1 is the weight of the first layer followed by a ReLU activation, for example, nonlinear activation function. And uh, then we multiply W2 uh, all the way to WL. Uh, so here, uh, it's, this is a, a new network for K class class classification problem. Uh, so this F actually is a, denotes a uh, K dimensional vector, K dimensional vector. And then fi finally, we will, um, we will use a, a softmax, softmax um, step and to transform the k dimensional vector to k uh, probabilities. And then you will choose the, uh, the probability, the large, largest probability as your, as your predicted class. So in this case, we omit the bias just for simplicity. And then we use W4 to denote all the, all the weights. And uh, so in deep learning, essentially, we try trying to optimize this loss function. And we have in total k different classes. For each class, a small k to denote a class. And we have nk different uh, nk uh, data points in each class. And uh, so this is the, yeah, so the, and the, the label for the case class is, is denoted by yk. So this is a one hot vector. And the, uh, uh, so the loss function we use here, we consider is a cross entropy loss. And uh, so here we also can add a uh, L2 penalty uh, to reflect the practice that we always use the uh, weight decay in training the neural network. So lambda yeah, is kind of similar to rigid regression. Lambda is positive. And now let's just present our layer PL model. So our layer PL model, uh, first of all, this is the original optimization problem that the uh, deep learning optimizer, such as SGD, wants to solve. And from the top-down approach, uh, we know that we can we partition the, the this thing into two parts. And uh, so this is the red part, uh, the topmost layer, and all the remaining layers are denoted in blue. Okay, in blue, everything is blue. So here, HKI is just denotes the, this thing, this thing. And uh, here, this is what? This is actually just the output from the second last layer, right? L minus one, second last layer. And uh, let's also, uh, and uh, this is also the input of the last layer. Let's call it, let's call this thing as the last layer feature or last layer activation. And now let's just present the, our layer PID model. Let's look at compare, look at the difference. The difference is that now in the objective, the penalty, uh, now it's gone. There's no penalty, right? There's no penalty. There's no rich penalty at all. 
Instead, we have two new constraints. And this constraint is put on the last layer, last layer. So last layer, WL, consists of k vectors, which correspond to a, a class. And we impose a L2 constraint. The L2 norm should be uh, bounded by yeah, the constant. And second constraint is on the last layer activation. Essentially, the, the, input, the output from the second last layer. So this should be also bounded by some constant. The, the L2 norm should be bounded. Uh, the, the, the sum of the L2 norm should be bounded by a constant. So this is a layer field model. And then now let's just uh, formally derive this layer field model. Oh, excuse me, let's informally. By informally, I mean that the derivation here is not is mathematically, is mathematically not rigorous, but we will gain some insights in the derivation in, during the process. So again, uh, let's uh, go back to the original optimization problem uh, for deep learning. Uh, so this is the L2 penalty. And the L2 penalty can be written into two parts. So this part is contributed from the, uh, the topmost layer. Okay, the last layer. And that this part denotes a contribution from all the remaining uh, layers, the first L minus one layers. Okay? And uh, so H, H denotes the, the last layer activation. And now from the Lagrange dual perspective, we know that if the original function, last function is a convex, and then you can always uh, uh, replace the penalty in the objective by a constraint. Okay, this is replaced by a constraint. This is replaced by another constraint. And this, is, uh, the, this uh, transformation is equivalent if the objective is convex and the strong duality holds. For convexive problems, most of the time, strong duality holds. So this is not an issue if the objective is convex. But however, in our setting, the objective is uh, certainly is non-convex. Non so deep learning is a highly non-convex problem. So this transformation actually is not, equal, is not exact. So this is not a one-to-one -one map. And uh, here, and the, the next step is to, uh, is to rewrite here, is to uh, the, express the second constraint by this inclusion. Okay? So this constraint is saying that the, this should be bounded by C2, right? And this, then it's equivalent to say that the mapping the collection of H should be bounded, uh, should be follow this uh, image, in image. So here H is a function of W minus L. W, w minus, minus L should satisfy what? Satisfy this constraint. So they are equivalent. And now let's just replace, yeah, right in this way, right in this way. So this is not final yet. Why? Because this constraint is hard to, it's hard to, um, use in our analysis is still not explicit. Our next step is to use an ansatz. So this ansatz is a very aggressive assumption. And uh, certainly this assumption is only for technical convenience. It's not, it's not close to reality at all. So we just assume that the, the, <coughs> the constraint here, uh, W minus L, uh, the, all the weights bounded below by C2, the mapping of this H uh, actually is approximately an ellipsoid. Yeah, an ellipsoid. <laughs> and uh, so th this is a, a very aggressive uh, assumption. And uh, so, and uh, but this is something that we have to use, you know, to simplify our derivation. And, uh, and now we get this uh, layer field model. Our layer field model is just here. And now we use W to denote WL just for simplicity. For simplicity, we drop the dependence and drop, drop the L letter in the sub, subscript. And then, and then we can justify a bit the, why this and that at least makes sense. Although it's math, not mathematically rigorous, but it makes sense. Why, for example, here W is already in the L2 space, right? Because the L2 constraint then presumably H should live in the dual space of W. And the dual space of W is also an L2 space. And uh, so, so it makes sense that we have, have some L2 constraint. And then later we will have another, ju ju another justification for the ends Okay, uh, now let, let, let's summarize here. 
So this is our layer pin model. And this is for the uh, prediction constraint because this is a final step, uh, final layers for prediction, just uh, as in log logistic regression, right? Uh, for K class logistic regression, you have K uh, vectors, right? Or, at, or maybe K minus one vectors. And this is for representation because HKI is a representation. It's a representation of an image of an image in the K class, in the case class, right? So this is, uh, there should be some constraint on the, on the repre re representation perspective. And uh, so this is, describes the uh, layer pin model is to approximate deep learning in the terminal phase of training, meaning that the, the, the model uh, is already well trained for a long time. It does not capture the training dynamics of deep learning. And the two constant depends on weight, uh, weight decay and the, and the you are show and the, again here this uh, the program mathematically speaking is still non-convex because uh, there's two interaction terms between w and the h but however um it seems to only involve two uh, variables i will show you that it is analytically checkable so that's a good thing and uh, and the and uh, so now comes the important thing so now it does not depend on the data the data x ki now it's gone so there's some good thing and the bad thing the, the bad thing that of course information is lost right so because the data is so rich they contain so much information and the but data the data dependence here is gone in our layer pin model certainly we will lose lots of information compared to the real world neural networks but the good thing that's our this makes our con conclusion robust because i have read some paper many papers in deep learning theory and uh, so sometimes the series looks very interesting and uh, but the theory say uh, assume some specific distribution on the data for example the data for, should follow gaussian distribution gaussian mixtures but in reality our images and uh, of course do not follow gaussian mixtures right so sometimes i'm a little bit uh, suspicious yeah maybe the the theorem relies on the gaussian mixture assumption but in our case, in the layer field model setting case, uh, there's no such issue, right? Because we do not assume any distribution. So th this makes our conclusion more robust. Yeah, let me pause here for a moment and uh, for any questions. Yeah, if no, uh, no questions, now let, let me uh, move on. Yeah, so now let's, we have an echo for our deep learning uh, theory. And let's check whether this is uh, uh, satisfy our, uh, our criteria. First of all, is, is it mathematically checkable? And uh, yes, uh, I will show you. And uh, so does this maintain some characteristics of, uh, of deep learning uh, of, some, of our interest? And um, yes, to, uh, for some characteristics, not everything, but there are some properties of deep learning that are still maintained in the layer, layer pin model. And the uh, third, does it provide some insights uh, for, uh, for the practice? And uh, I think so. And we, we will show you an example. So last, does it, does it address any Leo Bremer's questions? Oh, unfortunately not. This is beyond the, our uh, uh, reach at this moment. It's too, too difficult to do it. So now let's try to do something and uh, uh, something uh, useful using uh, using deep, uh, using the layer pin model. So let's try, first try to explain neural neural collapse. So uh, so let's consider uh, the setting where we are doing K class classification, and we have K classes, and we assume that the uh, our training the data set is balanced. By balanced, I mean that um, different classes have contain the same number of data points. So um, the first class uh, contains n1, but it's the same, uh, the same as n2, right? They are all equal. And uh, so in this balanced setting, can we get some uh, results, theoretical results using uh, for the layer PID model? So, yeah. So yeah, we have the, the following theorem. The, this theorem is saying that, uh, excuse me. This error saying that uh, uh, W star and, and the H star are the global minimum 
of the layer feed model. Okay, here they are global minimum and uh, they are not local. And uh, then and the loss function is chosen to be the cross entropy loss function. And then we must have this uh, identity. Uh, so this identity is saying that uh, first of all, HKI should be equal should be equal to WK star up to a some scaling factor. So this means that here uh, it's independent of I, right? Independent of I does not depend on I. So this means that uh, here this value, the last layer activation only depends on the class membership, only depends on K. So no matter where, uh, which should, uh, images you are in the data set, as long as you, and the two images are in the same class, and then the last layer activation should be, should be equal. Yeah, should be equal. And uh, so, and the third, uh, second, so this is further equal to MK star. So MK star actually, what is MK K star? Actually, they form a K simplex ETF, a triangular type frame. So, what are K simplex ETF? Now, let, let's show you. So, a K sim simplex ETF actually denotes a collection of K vectors, and they are all equal length. They are they are equally long, and they form uh, each pair of the K vectors actually span uh, the same uh, equal size angle. Okay, and then. Last, we make the angle the largest possible. So, so translate in, in probability theory. So this is a very um, basic question um, in many probability test books. So we have K random variables and uh, each uh, with mean zero and the variance one. So they are standardized. So if suppose that each pair has the same correlation, which is a row, and then the question is, what's the minimum possible value of rho? So we know that the minimum possible value here is just uh, minus one over k minus one. So the largest, largest corresponding angle is the cosine, uh, 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 arc cosine. Okay, so just show you some examples. When k is two, we know that the largest possible angle of k is, uh, is uh, largest possible angle is 180 degrees. Okay, so this, that's, that's nice. When k is three, it's impossible that uh, uh, for the three vectors, each pair spans 180, it's impossible. Uh, so the largest angle here is, is 120 degrees is the largest. And when k is three, uh, the construction is only possible in three dimensional space. So here, this means that the, the the, the interpretation here, again, let me emphasize is that uh, here, uh, no matter which class you are in, uh, no matter as long as you are in from the same class, and then they are just the same in, in terms of the last layer activations. So no matter it's a German Shepherd, Husky, uh, Chihuahua, yeah, all different breeds of dogs, they are all dogs, as long as you are in the same class, in the, in the, in the class of dog. So, so this is the activation. Uh, so this, uh, excuse me, this is the uh, uh, yeah last layer activations. And uh, so here, um, I just you, you maybe you see that there are four dots, right? Four dots here. Actually, these four dots actually should be e exactly equal to each other because they are from, they are from the same class. And this is the last layer uh, classify, which is W. And actually, they are all equal to each other if you do a translation after. Uh, by up to a scaling factor. So actually, this is uh, uh, this is exactly the neural collapse phenomenon discovered by David Donahoe and his students, uh, Papia and the Han, and they are, they discovered neural collapse in two thousand twenty, exactly. So the, our phenomenon is exactly neural collapse. So briefly speaking, neural collapse say, is saying that uh, during the terminal phase of training. Um, so all the uh, last layer activations were collapsed to, to, the stem, to the class means as long as they're in the same class. And the, the class means standard actually uh, form an ETF and the last layer of, of also uh, forms, uh, classifies also collapsed to the uh, ETF after, up to a scaling factor. And they also say something about the decision. And uh, so uh, David Donahoe's paper was very, yeah, 
all about empirical, empirical experiments. So they did a ton of experiments to discover neural caps without any theory. But their, their paper is very insightful. And uh, so to, it said, uh, for example, they discuss how neural caps imply for generalization and the large margin and the robustness. It's a very interesting article and highly recommended. But our paper, our work in some sense, um, provide a theoretical explanation for neural caps. But I should also want to mention that there are some concurrent work using, uh, using different models to justify neural caps. So let's see an animation. So this animation is uh, it's borrowed from David Donahoe's paper. So yeah, let, let's do it again. And uh, so this is capture the training, yeah, training process. And so this is the beginning, this is the middle, this is the, yeah, uh, quite late stage, and this is the final. And you see, uh, as training progresses, um, different uh, different points in the same class, well, yeah, they will converge. Finally, they will converge, they will collapse, they will collapse the same point. So when I first, uh, uh, I first got uh, to know uh, this result by attending a online seminar given by David Donahoe last, I think, last uh, in in August, in August uh, last year. So when I when I was attending his uh, talk, I yeah I was very amazed at the neural caps because uh, in deep learning most results are very um, um, not very random noise uh, noisy and uh, so it's really uh, unusual to see such uh, geometrically uh, geometrically elegant and uh, mathemat mathematically elegant results in in deep learning. I was I was totally surprised. And uh, so our work actually was motivated by, entirely motivated by David Donahoe's work. So now let's try to justify the Leopold model, uh, justify the Leopold model again. And recall that our, the main step, step in the derivation of Leopold model is the ansatz. We assume that the image of this uh, uh, mapping is a, a, an ellipsoid, okay? This give, gives us the second constraint. And now let's consider a variation of the constraint. Let's consider LQ constraint. Let's replace two by a different number, Q, L, L2, LQ norm. Actually, we have a such theorem. Actually, in our theorem, Q can be even smaller than one. So this result is saying that if Q can be any value, as long as Q is not equal to two, then neural graphs will not, be, will not happen for this optimization program will not happen for the global minimum of this optimization program. So this theorem says that Q being two, the choice of Q being two is unique. It's unique, it's unique in the sense that this is unique for the layer, for the layer P model to have consistent results with the real, with, with experiments. So in this sense, Q being two is really, it's the only choice we can, we can, we can use for the layer P the model. So this somehow justifies why the ellipsoid here makes sense. Because ellipsoid here is only, yeah, in some sense, comes down to a weighted L2 constraint. So here too, it's fundamental in, in this sense. So now uh, we have explained layer P the model, uh, neural graphs using our layer P the model. Now let's try to do something slightly more different. Let's try to do something even M for higher. Can can it predict something new? And uh, so they, let's try to predict a new phenomenon, uh, which we call uh, minority collapse. So now we have done uh, analyzed in the balanced setting. Now let's move uh, beyond balanced setting. Let's move on to imbalanced setting. So in the imbalanced setting, we mean that uh, different cl classes can have different number of data points, right? So this is the reality. In reality, different some classes, some classes are much larger than the others in terms of, of data point, number of data points, right? So as a simple step, uh, starting point, let's consider yeah, this setting. Uh, we have, um, we have um, the first KA classes are relatively large, but they are all equal in terms of their size. Their, their size is NA, okay? We call them majority cl class, classes. And for the remaining classes, that they are KB uh, classes. We call them minority classes. So they are relatively small. 
and each has a size nd. Okay, they are re relatively small. Now we call the ratio between a and nd the imbalance ratio. If the imbalance ratio is large, then this shows that the, the problem is highly imbalanced. Okay, so in this case, uh, so we first of all, we face a technical challenging uh, to deal with uh, once we move beyond balanced chaining. So this is because we don't have closed form expression uh, once we move beyond uh, balanced chaining. Um, but the good thing that uh, we can we can create a technique called a convex re relaxation to uh, to uh, overcome this difficulty. Uh, so this convex relaxation actually is very simple. Essentially, our idea is that to replace and to uplift our solution of the situation variable, which namely h and w, by a matrix. So, so to do that, let's first uh, consider the class mean. So this is the last layer activation average over. Uh, data points in the same class. And then now let's uh, consider this matrix. This matrix has two K rows, the first K rows from H and the last K rows from W, right? And the last K columns. And then now let's transpose and do, 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 do transpose and times the same matrix. So by definition, uh, X is a positive semi-definite matrix. So it's a SDP and it's a two K by two K sem positive semi-definite matrix. And uh, let's examine what kind of conditions that this matrix have to satisfy. So first, the uh, has two K diagonal entries, and the for, for the first K entries, and the average to satisfy this constraint should be should be smaller than each. And uh, for this, and this step actually is is from uh, the cauchy schwarz inequality, and this constraint actually uh, is down. It's just the second constraint in the layer Peter model. And the, the second um, equality, uh, uh, secondly, let, we examine um, the average of the last k diagonal entries of this big matrix, and this should satisfy this inequality. And this actually from the, just comes from the first uh, inequality of the layer Peter model. And now let we have just uh, we have uh, we just get this uh, uh, optimization program, and uh, so. And this is the two constraints. And the last, we require that X should be a uh, positive semi-definite semi matrix. And uh, our objective is yeah, now it's become convex because now ZK is a single variable. There are no interactions between uh, like WH anymore. So technically speaking, this is not a semi-definite program because here the objective is not a linear, linear functional of ZK. Uh, but somehow this is not a technical issue because uh, the, the objective is still convex. So just we can still solve this mission, the, the whole thing just as, as if it were a semi-definite convex program. So it's uh, not an issue. And now uh, this lemma basically tell, the, looks a little bit um, uh, technical heavy, but uh, the, uh, the implication is very simple. So this lemma is basically saying that now we can just abandon the layer Peter model. We can just look at the uh, convex uh, re relaxation. Uh, so in, in slightly more detail, we can get the uh, global minimum of the convex relaxation, and then we can re recover. We can recover the solutions of the layer Peter model by, for example, example taking square root of a of x. Why do we need to take square root of, of x uh, star? Because simply because here, here w, uh, x is simply, in some sense, is w is just the square of this matrix, right? Now you should take square root, but uh, it's not unique. And so we need to do a rotation. So P is a rotation. It's a partial orthogonal matrix, okay? So here the class within each class in terms of the last layer activation is still the same. So it does not depend on I, okay? I is a, uh, only depends on the class membership. But there's no longer a uh, collapse between uh, classifies and the uh, and the classifies and the and the last layer features. So H, uh, H, I, H, K, and the W, K are no longer in general are no longer parallel to each other. So now let's use the, this convex relaxation to examine 
uh, something uh, using some exper numerical experiments. Let's examine the average cosine of be between class minority classes. So a little bit long, right? So here, uh, for example, here we have Ka is three, then Kb is, uh, is seven. So we have seven minority classes. And now let's try to uh, compute uh, consider they are the pairwise angles between the seven minority classes. And uh, for the angle, let's compute the, the cosine of the angle. And then let's consider the average of all these angles, the average cosine of, uh, yeah, of all these the minority. And uh, there are some in numerical surprise uh, coming from our experiments. So here, once the imbalance ratio is above some threshold, we see that the cosine actually hits exactly exactly hits one. So we know that if the cosine is one, then the angle, all, all the angles must be zero, must be zero. So this means that all the angles, all the classifieds actually between the minority of the minority classes, they all span zero angle. They just collapse. There's no, it's impossible to distinguish between two different classes as long as they are in the, they are from the minority part. So this uh, kind of thing, phase transition happens uniformly from, uh, for different configuration of K and KB, and also for different values of EW and EH. So we have a theorem, and this theorem is basically saying that uh, if the balance ratio is uh, tends to infinity, and then the last layer features between from the minority part will be equal to each other in the limit. But this is uh, there's a gap between what we observe here and uh, what we can prove in this proposition. So this is uh, the gap is that uh, in the experiments we know that once the inverse ratio is above some constant, some finite value, then W k star and W k prime star should be equal to each other, right? But we can only uh, prove it if the limit tends to infinity. So this is a gap and we, uh, we cannot prove it for the moment, for the general case. So once the minor, so this phenomenon is called minority collapse, although it's not everything now stays in, uh, in theory. But once the minority collapse happens, we know that uh, it's impossible to distinguish between minority, different minority classes. So the prediction conditional on the minority classes are completely rendered. A complete random. So the performance will, of course, be pretty bad. So this is an illustration of how minority collapse could happen. So we see that as the imbalance ratio increases, and the two minority, the two minority classes actually, uh, their classifieds become closer, closer to each other. Right? Finally, they will be equal, exactly equal to each other. And then meanwhile, the majority classes will be growing in terms of the and the, the length of its classifier is always growing in this manner if, when R is increasing. Yeah. So this is how minority collapses happens from a theoretical perspective. And uh, the intuition behind, behind the minority collapse actually is very simple. So in this summation, if the imbalance ratio is high, most uh, log terms actually will be contributed by the majority classes. And as a result, once we, if we want to minimize this uh, sum, sum, and our, we emphasize too much on the majority part because we care so much about majority and uh, neglect the minority part. So as a result, the minority part actually uh, has no space to survive. And uh, so essentially it's a competition, competition for space. So this is an example like the killer whales, uh, how killer whales hunt for fish. And they will yeah, uh, make the, the small fishes and, yeah, and the shrink and the shrink to a small, uh, a small region, a small region. And, and, uh, and, but they occupy a much larger space. In this way, the, the, the fish will, will, suffer, will suffer from lack of oxygen. The finally, they will yeah, move much more slowly. So this is how, uh, how killer whales hunt for fish. And this is essentially uh, how behind the tuition of uh, min minority crabs. So, so far, minority crabs stays, stays 
in a uh, state scale states in uh, theory, right? Theory. We haven't done any real experiments well, for real uh, real world neural networks. Now let's try to do new, real neural networks experiments. And so our, re uh, our results shows that actually minority collapse really occurs in experiments for real neural networks. So this is some experiments uh, for BGG and, uh, and the ResNet and uh, across uh, different uh, benchmark data point uh, data sets like fresh MNIST and the CIFA 10. So what we observed is that if, when the imbalance ratio is above some threshold, excuse me, the imbalance ratio is above some threshold, the cosine will hit either one or very close to one. So this is experiment. So it's unrealistic to expect that the, the cosine, the angle is exactly exact zero. But what often happens is that if the imbalance ratio is high enough, and then the cosine is about, uh, for example, 0.9. So the angles between uh, different pairs from the minority classes will be maybe only five degrees. So they were already very close to each other, right? So, so the collapse essentially happens from a practical uh, perspective. So this is some experiments. So, uh, so you see they were also collapsed. And uh, here's a prediction using uh, our layer model and the deep learning actually they match very well. So the circle and the and triangle, they are almost the same. Okay, so now let's move on to the third part. It's about how, uh, how can we um, uh, mitigate minority collapse? So the idea is to make minority stronger. From the automatic program, when we discuss the intuition behind the minority collapse, it's essentially because the minority, uh, minority, minority training examples speak less they speak less, they, they are represented less in the, in the optimization uh, program. So our idea is, uh, is to yeah, oversample um, for those who are, who are less represented in the, in the training data set. Uh, so this is a, a very old technique, a classical technique in, yeah, in, in machine learning and the statistics oversampling. So in this part, we are not trying to uh, come up a new uh, a solution, a new solution to overcome minority collapse. Instead, we are just analyzing an existing technique to, uh, to deal with imbalanced training and to show you how the layer PID model can help us analyze, analyze the performance of, uh, of, of oversampling for imbalanced training. So imbalanced training is just very simple, for example, to introduce a uh, in, uh, oversampling rate, WR. So WR can be, for example, it can be two. So this basically means that we double, essentially double the size, effect, effectively double the size of, uh, of minority training examples. If WR is 10, basically we yeah, make uh, uh, 10 copies, essentially 10 copies of, for those minority training examples. We just increase their weight in the optimization uh, from the optimization perspective. So the corresponding of the layer PID model act in the oversampling uh, by taking into account oversampling. It's also very simple. We just incorporate a oversampling rate in the in this part. Okay, then everything else is the same. So this theorem is basically saying that, roughly speaking, is saying that uh, uh, by oversampling. From the layer Peter model perspective, the is the effective the effective uh, the effective uh, training uh, <clears throat> training examples for the minority classes now becomes WR the oversampling rate mod uh, times NB. So if WR is two, so basically from the layer Peter model perspective, you have doubled the size of the minority classes, okay? So for example, we know that uh, neural collapse will happen if the size are uh, all equal across different uh, classes, right? So we, if the WR times MB is equal to NA, then WR, the oversampling rate, is just equal to the imbalance ratio. So if you, we choose oversampling rate in this way, then neural collapse actually is recovered. It's back, it's back again. So this is an illustration. And uh, so 
and uh, without oversampling, the two classes, the two magnetic cl classes uh, are collapsed to each other. And uh, then if we choose a, a WR oversampling rate slightly larger than one, and then, yeah, so the two minority collapses will be distinguishable. So they will become different. And then if we choose a even larger oversampling rate, and the oversampling rate is just equal to the imbalance ratio. And then we basically recover neural collapse. In this case, every angle, so uh, every pairs of angle span 120 degrees. So now let's try to use layer pitted model to understand. Uh, so the prediction of, of the effect of oversampling at this moment using layer pitted model is all about theory, right? About theory. And then now let's try to do some experiments. So our experiment shows that one, when, once the oversampling rate is large enough, actually it's equal to the imbalance ratio. Then the basically neural collapse will happen again. So this is where the cosine actually hit this uh, dashed line. So this dashed line actually is just the, the, uh, the, the case where the cosine is equal to minus one over k minus one. Here k is 10, if I remember, and then it's just the one over nine, one over minus one over nine. So this is where, uh, uh, the minority classes spend the same angle with the majority classes. So they are all the, the same. They, are, they all become symmetric in this, in this case. So, so this says that minority collapse here really happen. Uh, it can be really solved using oversampling from this perspective. And now let's care about the test performance. Okay, so here everything is about in the training data set. Now let's move on to the test data set. Once we move on to the test data set, we see that uh, uh, no matter on the minority part or the overall data set, using oversampling, we will always gain the improvement. We will improve the test performance. For example, in this case, we improve the test performance on the minority part by, a, by 25%, 25%, which is very significant. But however, the when it's the largest possible uh, improvement obtained, it's usually it's attained by a oversampling rate. It's neither one or equal to the imbalance ratio, which is 1,000 in this case. It's something between. For example, usually it's 100. So 100 is the best usually in terms of test performance. And so this is a, a slightly uh, gap between uh, what, uh, layer pitted model can 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 predict at this moment, because for the from the training perspective, uh, the best choice is to set the oversampling rate equal to the oversampling over uh, imbalance ratio, which is one thousand, because this is where neural collapse occurs. But this is but from the training, but from the test performance perspective, it's better to choose a slightly smaller oversampling rate. So this is uh, so this is not achieved, and uh, so 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 this is an open question. The open question is that how can we select an oversampling rate uh, to maximize the test performance? So far, the layered model at this as current perform current format cannot cannot uh, deal with this question, and so this is an open open question uh, for for future research. So now let me conclude the talk. And uh, so the layer Peter model actually is trying to understand uh, how real world neural networks uh, are, are doing. So real, neural, real world neural networks are very, uh, contains many more layers, many layers like uh, 20 layers or more than 100 layers. It's just like a tower. And, uh, but our layer Peter model is just to keep the topmost layer and compress all the remaining layers as a single layer. So essentially we keep two layers. And uh, so this is a dramatic simpl simplification, but somehow from this talk, I hope that I have um, convinced you that uh, at least this is a useful surrogate. And uh, for future research, it's, uh, it's a interesting uh, direction to uh, go to the general imbalance uh, uh, setting. So, so far we have only examined the case where uh, the, 
the class size uh, takes two different values, either nk or nb. But in general, uh, different classes can have all different size, right? So it's a, uh, yeah. And uh, it's also interesting to examine different with different loss functions. The last, uh, uh, it's also interesting to examine minority class to fairness. So fairness now is a very uh, increasingly uh, very hot ac active research area in AR in machine learning and the artificial intelligence uh, research. And uh, when minority collapse happens, so this implies that the, 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 the performance, the prediction performance on less represented groups are very noisy. They are less accurate, less re reliable. And uh, so this will cause some fairness, for example, if, so how come that I, since just because I'm less, rep, rep, uh, I'm a minority group, I'm less represented, and so the, pre the decision making on my part is, is, is less reliable than, and than the others. So this is not fair in this sense, right? And uh, it's interesting to, uh, to consider how minority caps yeah, uh, relate uh, fairness, for example. So most, uh, uh, from a theoretical perspective, uh, it's, more, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's an important question to examine, to extend to multiple layer peer model, for example, uh, we can consider um, maybe peer out two layers or even more. And uh, so the optimization program is, uh, is ready. It's just given by here, but the analysis becomes horrible. Uh, so far I, we have tried, but didn't make much progress. And uh, it's also interesting to capture the training dynamics and uh, for using the layer PID model. Of course, this requires some extension. And, uh, and the last, it's also interesting to uh, understand why the ansatz. Uh, already the ansatz is not mathematically, it's a, it's a dramatic sim simplification, but somehow why does it uh, give some meaningful, useful predictions? And then now let's, let me summarize. So the layer pinnacle model is a minim, minimal wrapper of prediction, which is given by W, the, the, the last layer weights, uh, and also the representation and the, the last layer activation. So it's a non-convex program, but as you, you uh, as I have shown you, uh, but using a convex relaxation technique, we can yeah we can analytically uh, analyze analyze this program, and this uh, can explain some existing phenomena called the neural caps when the 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 training is balanced. When this is imbalanced, we we predict a new phenomenon called the minority caps. Here, I want to emphasize that uh, this is perhaps the only example I'm aware of in deep learning theory where some phenomena in deep learning is first predicted by uh, theory before its confirmation by experiments. So mo most of the results in deep learning are from, uh, at least uh, to the best of my knowledge, are all from, were all from experiments, doing tons of experiments. And the theory does not predict something uh, new before doing experiments, but the uh, minority collapse is a, is a rare example in this sense. And the last is also, again, some insights into deep learning training in the case where, uh, when, for example, the data set is highly imbalanced. So this is a reference, and uh, this uh, we also have updated our code and, and the data set on uh, GitHub, and this is the funding support. So last, I want to uh, emphasize the three questions by Leo Bremen. So I think this is still a long way to go to uh, uh, develop a comprehensive uh, deep learning theory. And uh, so currently, uh, we are still far away from the, the ultimate goal. And uh, so this is something that makes me very excited. And I hope that someday uh, someone, um, someone will present us a, a, a good enough deep learning theory and that we can use this theory to do something interesting, um, both in theory and the methodology. Okay, and uh, my, my talk is done. And uh, thank you very much for your attention and, uh, and uh, any question. Thank you very much, Professor Su, for the interesting talk. So we mm -hmm. have 10 minutes for questions and comments from the floor. Mm -hmm. Uh, hi, how are you? Uh, yeah, so it's a great talk. Uh, sorry, I was uh, teaching, so I came a little bit late. Um, I'm just wondering, um, 
can this work bring some insights on, uh, for example, the architecture of uh, neural networks? Like, how do we uh, leverage it to have a like to design the structure? For example, do you have any insights? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Th thanks for the very interesting question. And uh, and uh, the, for example, and the and the for. For the neural caps, uh, actually, I think it can say something about uh, the architecture of deep learning. And, uh, and uh, yeah, maybe let me go to the neural caps part. So neural caps says that the last layer uh, features actually will form and uh, last layer classified will form ETF, right? And uh, so this actually implies that maybe at the beginning, uh, we can just fix the last layer classified and uh, to be uh, to be the ETF even before training before training so this will somehow uh, reduce the, the 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 effective reduce the number of layers effective number of layers from L to L minus one because we do not need to bother with the training of the last la last layer uh, in the neural network. So this is, I think, something uh, we can we can say about using the layer pyramid model. Yeah, uh, in, in terms of ar architecture design. Okay. Yeah. Great. So, 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 from my understanding, the neural collapse is like um, uh, kind of uh, as as the network goes deeper, you you sky you, you always converge to the same function. Is that at the end for the last layer? Is that yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. True. Yeah. So this is the first discovered by yeah Donahoe using experiments. Yeah. If you mm -hmm. chain uh for it for long for really really long time, and then the right. the representation for different images will will converge as long as they are from the same class. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. This is a great. Yeah. So yeah, so this is uh, surprising because this is something surprisingly uh, simple, but uh, uh, but it was not discovered by Donahoe until last. Yeah, it was not discovered until last year. Oh. Yeah, okay. I think uh, Professor Choi want to ask some question. He uh, he raised his hand, I, I, I saw. Mm -hmm. Okay, no? Yeah, I, I have a, a simple uh, question, yeah. I think the uh, idea of uh, sur surrogate is very, very good to understand the neural uh, network. And uh, I just want to make my understanding clear. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, your uh, result uh, can be used for uh, regression also. Is that right? Uh, for, for what? Excuse me, I uh, didn't. Re regression. Regression. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Regression pro problem. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, perhaps not, I guess, uh, uh, because here uh, it's uh, specialized to K class classification for deep learning. Oh, and, okay. Uh, for regression, uh, for regression, the issue is that yeah, all output is a sing is a scatter is a single uh, mm -hmm. value. Uh, but uh, uh, for the minority uh, neuro neural crafts and the minority crafts uh should be the discussion should be in the uh, multiple dimensional space like in k-dimensional space okay thank you i, I see yeah uh, professor su may i ask a question yeah sure please uh thank you very much for the very interesting talk i just want to confirm uh -huh. with you thank the you. procedure of this uh, over sampling is that uh -huh. similar to doing a bootstrap but uh, with a larger larger sample size, like uh, you originally have n sample size, then you draw. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah larger think, sample size. Yeah, yeah, exactly equal. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, essentially the same as Bootstrap, but we just uh, uh, give different weights for different classes depending on their class size. If this is a uh, relatively uh, less represented class, and we sample them more in the training process. And uh, if they are more represented, we decrease their weight. Yeah, yeah. So uh, in your simulation, it's like the theoretically the optimal weight is like 1,000 for the minority group. Is that right? Uh, yeah. From the training perspective, uh, from the training training loss perspective, uh, it's best uh, to choose the oversampling rate to be equal to uh, the imbalance ratio. So in yes. this way, uh, different classes will be equal to each other in terms of I size. See. Yeah. So this is just make the uh, neural class back, back again. So neural class is it, a good thing. Neural class means that. Uh, Yes. All the classes are equally represented. They are treated equally well. And uh, so the margin and the robustness is the largest. I see. For example, in this here, and uh, it's easy to make mistakes between these two different classes because they are close to each other. But uh, right. once neural collapse happens, then uh, they are, each pair are very well separate, se separated. So it's less likely to make a mi mistake in the prediction. But however, the story is that uh, uh, neural caps uh, here only occurs in the training um, part. Training uh, using oversampling rate equal to the imbalance, imbalance rate does not carry to the test test domain. When you in, you, are, you are you care more about the test performance, that does not. And uh, yeah. so a, the best possible value of uh, oversampling rate is something smaller than uh, 1,000, which is the imbalance uh, ratio. But, but, but we don't know uh, what's the exact value and to choose. We don't know. I we see. Yeah. yeah, so relatedly, I was wondering, because when you do the bootstrap, you are using the in pre distribution function, right? You draw resampling from the in pre distribution function yeah. uh, of However, it's not the population. I mean, the true value of the population, it's from the empirical distribution. Mm -hmm. So uh, in some cases in econometrics, because of this kind of bootstrap uh, from the empirical distribution function, the bootstrap will fail because you are not actually using the population true value, but uh, this is not a concern in your, in your case, right? Mm -hmm. It's yeah, not a yeah. concern in your case. Yes, I see. I see. Thank, thank you very much. Oh, thank, thank you for your question. Thank you. Uh, I got a question from the chat. Uh, uh, how do you know which one belongs to minority group to over it? Uh, uh, so here, the minority or majority are just in in terms of the training size. Uh, so in the training data set, uh, we know that uh, some classes uh, contain more data points. Some classes contain less, uh, fewer data points. So this is uh, how we know uh, why some classes is, is a minority or some classes is a majority. But of course, uh, when you extend to the test domain when you really deploy your neural network in the for prediction and the, perhaps you, you you don't know because it's possible that some uh, minority class in the chain data set will become majority or, or, or more we don't know so <laughs> this is a different story in the training data set you sometimes also don't, do not know the number of the class Class size of classes, right? Like uh, if you have MNIST data, you have number zero to nine, but in the training data set, you don't know how much zeros are inside, right? Uh, uh, maybe we don't know in the online setting, but uh, in, in, in most, uh, uh, in most, uh, for most, uh, for example, uh, benchmark data sets, we know uh, the class sizes, right? We, we, we know before we change yeah. the network. And uh, so, so we, we should know which class are, 
are more represented or which are less represented. Mm. So, so I have also questions about how to choose the weight. Mm -hmm. So you, you cannot just use the cross validation. Uh, yeah, I think cross validation, yeah, can also be used, I guess. Uh, yeah, in principle, it's also can be, I think it can be used, or maybe we can use a holdout data set to monitor uh, the final training performance with different uh, uh, oversampling rate. And uh, we just uh, consider the, the best possible, uh, the best oversampling rate. And uh, but I, I guess this is the, will be very computationally, will be very challenging. Um, because the training and uh, training neural network networks already is uh, very expensive. Yeah. Uh, may I ask uh, another question uh, about yeah, yeah. The computational yeah. cost? Uh, so in, in this sense, uh, instead of doing oversampling, can you just uh, do subsampling for the majority class? I mean, so so you, I'm not sure, so you, you make the, the effect of the majority class smaller, but uh, you don't do the oversampling for the minority class. Is that uh, better in terms of computation? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah, I, I think uh, so oversampling and the uh, subsampling are basically uh, mathematically equivalent uh, because this is essentially, for example, uh, we just can uh, get rid of WR here and we here multiply yeah, yeah, yeah. one over WR. Uh, but yeah, yeah. maybe uh, it's more if we want to save computational uh, time, for example, we can just use a subsample for the majority the class. Yeah, we just yeah, discard some data points from the majority classes. We only keep the same portion, same size as the minority class. So in this way, the, the effective sample size for each class is just an MB, which is a much smaller. So in this case, maybe you can, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think this is something people pre, uh, use a lot in practice, especially where when MB both, uh, when the minority classes are already large, it's only small relative to the majority. In this right, case, I see. Sub something is a good choice to, to use, I think, yeah. I see, I see, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah my, my pleasure. Thanks for your very interesting question. Hello, Professor Su, and um, I have a question um, that I want to confirm. Mm -hmm. uh, in page 38, uh, mm -hmm. in the test set, mm -hmm. so you have the oversampling rate, uh, like 1,000 in the train set. Mm -hmm. Here you design the test set. Is that, is the test set has same, like the majority, uh, minority rate also as 100, uh, 1,000. Oh, thank you. If I remember correctly, in the test data set, uh, it's uh, balanced, it's balanced. Uh, different classes have the same number of their points. Yeah. Uh, so in the test set, it's balanced? Yeah, it's, uh, I, I think it's balanced, yeah, it's balanced. So is that possible? This cost the, um, the, the performance, uh, dampened by the balanced and by, because in the train test, you have uh, unbalanced design, but in the test set, you have the balanced design. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for the good, uh, good point. Uh, so in principle, um, if both um, uh, uh, the training and the test data sets are both imbalanced and uh, they are imbalanced, the ratio are the same, and then, the, Perhaps there's no much need to adjust for over uh, imbalance, imbalance using oversampling. Uh, oversampling or it's necessary or useful. It's just because uh, we have different fractions of 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 classes between uh, training and the and the test. Yeah, uh, because yeah. So we we say the class is a minority in the train, training. We also, we actually imply that uh, in, the, in the test data 
in the test data set, it will become mu much more popular. It will become yeah, equally represented. Yeah, so, so that's why. Yeah, so that's why oversampling is, uh, is, is, is useful, yeah. Oh, I see, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, I think time is over. We have now maybe 15 minutes for free talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, let me stop uh, sharing. Okay. <laughs> So in, in, in empirical research, you have maybe 10 classes, then you have to have nine weights, right? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So in, uh, for example, in two binary classification using the logistic regression, you only need to use one vector, right? Uh -huh. And the other uh -huh. is zero, uh, that is zero. Uh, mm. so, in principle, I, actually, in our case, uh, the WL, the last layer weights actually can can be reduced to from having L vector to L minus, minus one layer uh, vectors because the we can set one mm -hmm. one class as the as the baseline. Yeah, so the corresponding uh, classifier is zero. Yeah, because yeah, it will be the softmax. Yeah, softmax. Mm. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vijay, for your wonderful uh, talk. Yeah, I I just want to uh, know the uh, ask, know the situation of machine learning uh, for mm -hmm. uh, classification and regression. I think uh, from seven, uh, several years ago, uh, machine and uh, deep learning, uh, I, I mean the deep neural net network, uh, dominated many uh, methods. Yeah. And I want to know what is the situation now. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So deep learning is uh, really uh, becoming uh, very dom dominant in 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 many areas in machine learning and uh, yeah, especially for the um, uh, at, in the US, uh, especially for the new generation of students. And they are all very excited about deep learning. And uh, for example, uh, uh, the, the students, students in, in my department are all very familiar with uh, using PyTorch and the TensorFlow. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, they are much better at, at, at this than, 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 than me. <laughs> and so, and although they are students, they are still PhD students of statistics, but they are all very excited about the, uh, deep learning. And the and the somehow yeah yeah uh, my impression is that before deep learning um before deep learning uh, arises and maybe ten years ago um so there was actually close connection between statistics and their machine learning mm -hmm. uh, so ten years ago many machine learning people actually were all uh, were, were were also studying something like uh, high dimensional sparse linear regression like lasso and also, uh, also. Uh, but after uh, deep learning uh, be became uh, dominant and there are a huge, huge gap between statistics and the uh, and the machine learning and it seemed to me the two groups uh, took less between each other <laughs> so, hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think there are many other methods than like, uh, neural network. Uh, for example, uh, this decision tree, uh, mm -hmm. random forest, and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, does a neural network dominate uh, random forest for regression or classification now? Uh, uh, I, I, uh, I think uh, basically yes, I think. Uh, mm. But of course, it depends on different uh, areas, uh, different problems. Uh, so decision trees are still uh, quite effective um, for some problems, as far as I know. For example, the many, and um, there are many data set, data science competitions at at Gaggle. 
So many of the winning teams are using some um, tree-based methods using mm -hmm. like X XGBoost. And uh, so there are maybe, I, I guess there are more, these problems typically are some problems where we want to predict for somebody's, for example, somebody's income using uh, its education or some, some features. So usually the number of features are, is, are not that crazy. Uh, so it may be 100 features to predict to their outcome. Uh, but deep learning are more effective, I mean, in the case where uh, we don't have specific features, for example, like images and uh, and uh, languages. Uh, we don't know what are the right uh, features. Uh, and for example, how, how can we um, describe, uh, denote what is a I, right? What is an eye? So from from the pixels, from pixels, sounds, mm -hmm. we cannot tell this thing. So this is where deep learning is more effective. But deep learning, yeah, deep learning will automatically uh, construct the features for us. But if uh, the features are already constructed, maybe decision trees are already quite quite good. Yeah. Ah, uh, I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think the situation is. Uh, we do not have any great knowledge about the uh, causal uh, structure. Yeah, uh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. difficult exactly. for econometricians, I think, yeah. Yeah, exactly. When, the, when we have many different variables, but we don't know how do they interact with each other. Maybe mm -hmm. this is how deep learning will be very effective. And similarly, I think in the uh, deep minds, uh, protein folding problem. So how, how do any uh, amino acids uh, interact? It's a very complex thing, right? People don't understand it, uh, but uh, they can use deep learning to model how do the acids, amino acids interact. And in this way, they can uh, find the, the stable structure of the protein. <laughs> so this is, something remarkable and uh, yeah but yeah similar uh, we, we essentially we don't, don't have features to to do to start with yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah thank you yeah th thank you thank you uh professor su um i have another question i'm sorry mm -hmm. um at present the the deep learning can be mathematically analyzed to how many layers at most yeah, so currently, uh, I think um, basically two layers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, either two layers, and uh, because in the, in the sense that the original neural network just had two layers, then it's, uh, I think the literature is already quite rich, uh, uh, quite comprehensive uh, to, for, for this simple case. 